this morning and have you here. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to, uh, to be here this morning to share some thoughts with you. Uh, we tried our best to find somebody a whole lot better than me, but we just ran out of options and finally had to put my name on the list. But uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Appreciate Jonathan and those who lead us in worship every week and the job that they do. Before we get into the message, I just want to uh, just, just want us to be mindful that um, I, I think probably going to be occurring, occurring here within the hour is the inauguration of a new president for the United States. And uh, we certainly need to be a prayer for our country and, and hope and pray that today the world sees us, sees the better part of us than maybe what has been seen in recent days and recent months. Uh, but certainly we, uh, we need to pray for our country, for our new leaders, and uh, for um, the decisions that they'll make and, and their leadership. And so I just want to take a moment before I uh, begin the message, and the message has nothing to do with politics, so don't, don't think you're going to hear politics for the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever, but uh, I just think we need to pray for our country, so let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can gather in freedom today uh, on a Wednesday, and we can sing your praises, and we can talk about Jesus, and we can read from the Bible and we can do that without fear of persecution, without fear of anyone interrupting us or telling us we're doing the wrong thing. So, Lord, thank you for that platform of freedom that we have as citizens of the United States of America. We pray, Father, that as a new president, a new government is um, inaugurated today, new leadership comes into to office. We pray, Father, for peace first and foremost. We pray, God, that you would reign in the hearts of people and cause them to, Lord, if they want to protest, they can protest, but Lord, to do it peacefully, to do it without violence and without chaos, and uh, Lord, we just pray that calm heads and hearts would prevail, that leaders would rise up and be the voice of reason and the voice of true freedom. And Heavenly Father, um, we, we look at things very differently politically. Uh, but Lord, we pray that you would bring unity that only you can bring. We pray for Mr. Biden and those who will serve with him, that they might be wise. Lord, that they might hear uh, the voice of truth and reason and wisdom in all that they do. And um, Father, that they would govern for the good of everyone and not select few, whoever, whatever side that might be. And Lord, please help us, and maybe it needs to start in this room, but help us to know that freedom is a precious gift, that it has to be guarded, it has to be sustained and maintained, uh, Lord, not just by those who lead and those who govern, but by folks like us who sit in this room, who are citizens of this country. May we be people of good character and moral standards and who want the best, not only for ourselves and our own family, but for everybody. And so, God, we pray that we would see you work and move, and you would bring oneness and unity in this nation as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text this morning is going to be from Luke chapter 18. If you would like to follow along, you can turn to Luke chapter 18. I'm going to read verses 18 through 30. Luke 18, verses 18 through 30. And this is a story that uh, you're, if you're reading in your Bible and it has the little headings, this story is entitled, The Rich Young Ruler. And so uh, we want to look at his life or in this encounter he had with Jesus and draw out some lessons for ourselves. So Luke 18, verses 18 through 30. Luke says, a ruler questioned him, that means Jesus, questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he, that is Jesus, said, all these, uh, the, the rich young ruler said, all these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he, the rich young ruler, when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. 
For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he, this is Jesus speaking, Jesus said, The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. In a sort of a, a, a broad perspective, a philosophical sort of way, a, a big picture sort of way of looking at things, I think that all of us are looking for the same thing. And, I, and when, I, when I say all of us, I'm not just talking about the ones in this room. I'm talking about people in general are looking, generally speaking, for the same thing. Now, we may pursue it in different ways. We may think there are different things that lead to it. But ultimately, people, generally speaking, are all looking for the same thing, wanting to achieve the same thing. And that is, people want to be happy. People want to have peace and security. People want to, to know that there is some meaningfulness and some purposefulness to life. People don't want to go through life unhappy, unsecure, a life full of chaos, feeling like life has no meaning and life has no purpose. So, so we're, we're looking for something that gives purpose and gives meaning to life. Inevitably... We all come to a point in life, and, and some of you may have come to this point at, at, at this stage of your life, or if not, it's probably going to come soon, but there comes a time as you get older where inevitably you wrestle with the question or you find yourself thinking, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to life than just going through the motions, getting up every day, going to school, getting up every, getting up every day, going to work, trying to be a good person, trying to you know, check off all the boxes. There's got to be more to life than this. And I think about that as I read this story of this so-called rich young ruler who came to Jesus one day and asked him a question because I believe that this man was, was seeking that very thing. He was seeking Something that would put some eternal meaning, some eternal purpose into his life. This man comes to Jesus and we're told that he was a ruler. We're not really told what he was a ruler of. Many people think that he was probably a religious leader. Maybe he was a, a leader in the synagogue. Or, but we don't really know. He was a, he was a ruler, so he was obviously a man of, of uh, some means and some leadership or position in the community. And he came to Jesus with... An ultimate question. He came to Jesus and he said, he recognized Jesus as a good teacher. And he said, good teacher, he's really what he was saying, was saying, sir, I recognize, you're a good teacher. I'm interested in what you have to say. I'm interested in your opinion. And I've got a question for you. What do I have to do to have eternal life? I think another way of saying what he, is, what he was asking is, what do I have to do to find some real meaning and purpose, something that's bigger than me? What do I have to do to really find what life is really all about? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus heard the question, and, and he says, well, uh, you know the commandments, don't you? The things like don't commit adultery and don't murder and don't lie and don't steal and all those kinds of things. You, you know those. And, and Jesus knew the man would know these things. And the man said, well, sure I know those. I've, I've done all that since I was a little boy. Now, that's a pretty strong claim to make, isn't it? It's a pretty strong claim to make that you've done everything you were supposed to do from the time you were knee-high to a grasshopper. You were just this tall to say, well, yeah, I've done all that. I've kept all of those commandments. And Jesus, the interesting thing is that Jesus doesn't challenge him and say, now really have you? I'm sure you've broken this, that, and these other commandments. And Jesus probably knew whether he did or not. But Jesus doesn't challenge him. In fact, this guy probably was a pretty good man. Jesus didn't shake his head and ha, ha, ha and chuckle at him. Nobody stood up and said, well, I knew him when he was in high school and I knew what he was really like back then. Nobody challenged him. We can, we can assume that this man probably was a very religious man. He probably was a man of very good moral character, not perfect, probably wasn't true that he had kept all of the commandments from the time he was a, a, a teenager or a young boy. But he probably was a very moral person who led 
what you and I would consider, and the people of his day considered, a good life. He probably was more moral than most Christians today are. If he were to walk in this room today, somehow be able to be transported in this room today, we probably would look at him and go, he's a pretty good fella. He seems to have it together. He really lives a pretty good life. He had a lot going for him. In fact, he might have been the kind of guy who lived such a good life, had so much money, had such authority and charisma, and was so well thought of that some people were probably envious of him and some people probably resented him. Not because of all that he'd done wrong, but they were just like, man, nobody can be that good. And so he probably was a very good man. He had, he had kept all of the commandments. He had, he had been a good boy. He had been a good Jewish man. But he still felt incomplete. He still felt like somehow something's missing in life. Because the truth of the matter is, is that in the end, he really wasn't very different from anybody of his day, anybody of his community, nor any of us sitting here today. Because his problem was, and he didn't realize this, and this is what Jesus was challenging, was his problem was, is that he was seeking salvation or eternal life by chore chart or behavior chart. I don't know if any of you experienced this in the home you grew up in, but I grew up in a home where my parents expected my brothers and I to, you know, participate in the household and do different things around the house. And I can remember my mother having a chore chart that was hanging on the back of the kitchen door. And it had our names, Lane, Ken, and Michael. And then it had different chores and different days of the week. It was take out the garbage, wash the dishes, feed the dog, cut the grass. And it had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know. And, 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 and it had my name and certain ones of those things. And those were my chores. And if I did my chores, I, I got an allowance or I got to buy ice cream from the ice cream truck or got to get taken out to eat or, you know, something that you got some sort of reward. And that's the way a lot of people approach salvation. They expect to be saved by what they do or don't do. And there's looking for salvation by chore chart or maybe behavior chart that you, you experienced in, uh, when you were in elementary school. The teacher has the behavior chart and if you do all these things right and you don't have to move your little car or you don't have to move your light to yellow or red, then you're okay. And you, know, you get to go out to PE first or you get to be front of the line. What, some sort of reward. And that's the way we, that's the way we try to find meaning in, in ultimate things in our life is is doing it by behavior chart or chore chart. But this man who could say, you know, I've done all the commandments. I don't commit adultery. I've never murdered anyone. I haven't lied, at least not recently. He, he, had, he had done most of what he was supposed to do. He still said, you know, there, but there just seems to be something missing. You see that incompleteness because of the question he asks. He is like... People today who have everything going for them, but they sense there's got to be more to life than this. He thought he was good. He thought he was moral. He thought he was successful. And he was all of those things. But still he had a question. There was still something gnawing at him on the inside. He had an idea that something was missing. He didn't have a real peace. When he laid down at night, he, 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 that, it was just going through his mind. There's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be something else that I have to do to really have peace. I'm convinced that there are people all across our nation, all around this world, who lay down at the end of the day. They'll lay down tonight. When they go home, when the day and end of the day comes, they will go home to a 10,000 foot mansion that costs multiple millions of dollars. It'll have every modern convenience. They'll have every advantage there is to have in life. And when their head hits the pillow tonight, they will say, is that all there is to life? Is that all there is? I've got all of these things and I've got all of this stuff and things are going so well for me. Is that all there is? Is just to make it from morning to night without making some sort of big, committing some sort of big sin or doing something terribly wrong and just lay down at the end of the night and go, well, it's done. There's got to be more to life than this. There'll be people on this college campus. Some of you sitting in this room. Things are going well in your life. You're doing good. You're good student, great athlete. It's all going the way you want it to go. But when your head hits the pillow tonight, you'll say, you know, what was this day really all about? 
What is life really all about? Surely there's got to be more to life than this. And there is. And Jesus had a challenge for this young man. Look at what Jesus says in verse 22. It says, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess, distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't say, listen, you really haven't kept all the commandments. I know nobody's that good. And, and, and I don't think Jesus was saying this, this guy was perfect. I think Jesus wanted to get to the heart of the issue. He said, There's, you, you've done good. You've probably done all of those things as good as anybody could possibly do them. But there's one thing. There is one thing that is keeping you from the peace and the meaning and the purpose that you seek. In this case, it was this man's wealth. See, Jesus went exactly where this man didn't want him to go. This man wanted this conversation to go anywhere except to money. He wanted it to go anywhere except to his wealth. He, he, you know, he, he would love for Jesus to talk about relationships or law or a habit or a pattern of thinking. But in this case... It was his wealth. And when Jesus put his finger on that one thing, when he brought up that one thing, it was like he said, oh man, I, oh, I was hoping he wouldn't go there. I was hoping he wouldn't go there. But he did. Jesus put his finger on that one thing and we're told that this man became sad. He became depressed. He was sort of crestfallen. You could just see the air go out of him. Because in his response, it says, when the man, verse 23, when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Here's what I think this man probably was saying in his own mind and in his own heart in this encounter. He was saying, you know, eternal life is not worth losing all of my stuff over. Eternal life is not worth losing all of my bank account. Eternal life is not worth losing my prestige and my country club lifestyle over. Eternal life isn't worth all that. If it takes that to have eternal life, I guess I'll never have it. Because if I can't hang on to everything I have, everything that makes me who I am, then I guess I won't have eternal life. I guess I'll just have to pass. I guess I'll just have to... Let it go. And he was probably thinking, you know, that's sad because I would love to have it, but not at that price. And see, that's where human beings are. That's where people are. We're looking for happiness. We're looking for peace. We're looking for ultimate purpose. We're looking for ultimate meaning. And then something comes along like the gospel of Jesus Christ and says, here's how you can have it. And we go, yeah, man, that sounds great. I want that. Yeah, that, that really sounds interesting. But then the gospel says, here's the cost. And that's when a lot of people go, well, it sounds interesting. And it sounds nice. And as long as you want to talk about the religious stuff, we'll talk about the religious stuff. But when you start talking about it costing me something, I'll pass. Because I want it, but I don't want it at that cost. In other words, we don't really want it. We want it on our terms. You've heard the phrase, you've heard the old saying, the old proverb, he wanted his cake and he wanted to eat it too. What is that, man? I mean, what, that this just sounds crazy, doesn't it? It's kind of like you can attract more flies with honey. Well, who wants to attract flies? I mean, I try to kill flies. I'm not interested in attracting it. But he wanted to have his cake and eat it too. What that means is, you know, there are some people, um, you know, I have a, a wife and three daughters, you know, it's when it's birthday cake time. You know, they like to take pictures of the cake and all that kind of stuff, you know. Oh, isn't it so beautiful and all that kind of thing. You know, as a man, I'm like, this, let's just cut the cake. It's here to eat, you know. I'm not interested. I don't want to keep this cake. It's going to go bad anyway. So let's just eat the thing. But he wanted this cake and he wanted to eat it too. It means that he wanted to have it and admire it, but he also wants to eat it too and taste it. And in other words, he wanted it both ways. He wanted it his way. And that's the way that most of us are. Let me ask you a question. 
Jesus said to this man, he said, yeah, okay, I hear you. You've kept the commandments. You're a good religious guy. You're moral. You're successful. All that stuff. But there's one thing. There is one thing that's tripping you up. So here's the question for us. What is the one thing for you? What is the one thing that's keeping you from relationship with God through Jesus Christ? What is the one thing that's keeping you from knowing real peace, ultimate purpose and meaning in your life? What is the one thing that's keeping you from saying, I know that I have eternal life? What, what is that what is that one thing? What is it that even if it means that you won't give up, even if it means you'll never have real peace, even if it might cost you eternal life, how do you react when God brings up that one thing? Because God has this little habit of He'll put His finger, He'll bring up the thing that's keeping you from Him. He'll do it. You know, if you ever kind of start sniffing around this, and like you're going to get serious about, God, I really want to know you because I really want you in my life, and, and I really want to live for you, and I really want to walk with you, and I want to know you're there, and all these kinds of things, God will bring stuff up. How do you react when he brings that thing up that you're like, yeah, yeah you know, I'm, I'm just not ready to give that up yet. It just means too much to me. It's too fun. You know, I get too much enjoyment out of it. I like to be able to hang that over his head or her head. I, what is that one thing that you won't give up? Let me ask you something. Is it worth your peace? Is it worth eternal security? Is, is it worth ultimate meaning in your, in your life? The man came to Jesus and he said, Teacher, what shall I do? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What do you have to do, I'm asking us the question, what do you have to do to have peace with God? It's very simple, but it's very hard. If you want to have peace with God, you have to move over. You have to move over. Are any of you here, are you left lane drivers? You know, you get on the interstate and you like to drive in the left lane. If you're driving in the left lane, you need, to be doing, you need to do one of two things. You either need to be speeding or you need to move over. Speeding's a whole lot easier, isn't it? A lot more fun. Moving over, you've got to swallow your pride, don't you? Because that means somebody's going faster than you are. I admit, I'm a little competitive on the road. I am. You know, I'm the guy who in my younger days, would be narrating a NASCAR race as I'm driving down the interstate and that kind of thing. I'm guys, we love, we love speed and that kind of thing, you know. And, but I tell you, when I'm on the interstate and I'm in the left lane and I'm, I'm speeding, I admit it, I'm speeding, but there's somebody pressing me from behind, there's that part of me that's like, I ain't moving over. You may go around me, but I am not moving over. I'm not going to do that. Now that's, that's stupid. I know it is. But I'm not going to move over. Because moving over means I'm yielding. I'm getting out of the way. And I'm letting somebody... You know, the yield sign is the most offensive traffic sign there is out there. I hate them. Stop. I get it. Green for go. I get it. You know, the little swiggly line, meaning there's curves coming up. You better slow down. I get that. But yield... Because what does yield say? Yield says, you need to slow down and let this other person go first. But what a lot of us do when we see the yield sign, we speed up so we can get in front of them, right? See, moving over, yielding is the hardest thing to do. And if you want to have peace with God, you've got to step out of the center of your world. You've tried everything there is to try. You've done all, read all the books and you've done everything you can do. But you need to step out of the center of your world to truly have peace with God. This rich young man, he had been taught a lot of things about God, about life, about the world, about eternity. He had heard them since he was a child and he was doing pretty good at practicing them. He had been taught the commandments. But he had also been taught that life was about what you had and what you had accomplished 
not very different from what we're taught in modern day society. That life is about what you have and what you've accomplished, but still he was wondering if there was something more to make his life complete. And Jesus' response to him was a huge challenge, and it's a huge challenge to us, because Jesus says, he, does, he says, one thing you still lack, and then hear what he says, you have to take all of this into consideration. He says, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Jesus said, sell everything. And make me your everything. Sell everything and make me your everything. Jesus was calling this man to make nothing of everything and follow him. That's the challenge and that's the call that Jesus issues to everyone who ever encounters him. People would come to Jesus and say, I like your teaching. I think you're, I think you're, you know, I, I think maybe you may be the one, and I want to, I want to be one of your disciples. What, what is it going to take to follow you? And Jesus says, let go of everything and follow me. And somebody says, well, you know, let me go bury my dad first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Just come and follow me. Does that mean Jesus was saying, I don't go to your dad's funeral? No, that's not what he was saying. He was just saying that you've got to be willing to let go of everything and make me everything. If you really want to have eternal life, if you really want to have true peace, if you really want to have genuine relationship with God, Jesus did that over and over again. My guess would be that if Jesus had told this rich young man, this rich young ruler, if he had said, you know, if the guy came to him and said, sir, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus had said, well, here's what you need to do. You're rich, right? I go, yeah, I'm rich. I got a lot of money. Well, I'll tell you, since you're so rich... Why, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of kids in this community who don't have parents. Why don't you build an orphanage? And the guy probably would have said, that's a, that's a good idea. I, I'll do that. Or, or Jesus might have said, you know, there are a lot of hungry people in this community. Why don't you go down to the, to the local community kitchen, the soup kitchen, and, and why don't you volunteer to serve the homeless and the hungry? And the guy would have said, Man, that sounds great. I, I, I'll do that. I'm, I'm down with that. You see, because we love, when we're looking for meaning and we're looking for purpose, we love do more answers. We love do more answers. Well, you know, what do I have to do to really have peace with God? Well, do more of this or do more of that. And Jesus didn't give a do more answer. Jesus said, if Jesus had not said sell everything and he had just said give to the poor, this guy would have gone ahead, he would have puffed his chest out and he would have said, yeah, I'm going to home and I'm writing the biggest check I've ever written because he knew he could write a big check and still have plenty left over for himself. You see, that's our problem. That's our problem. But Jesus didn't say that. He didn't just say give more. He said, give up. Release. Let go. Give all. That's a challenge. That's a challenge that most of us can't meet. That's a challenge that a lot of people don't want to take up. There's a huge difference between give and even give more and give all. There's a huge difference between give and let go. You see, there's, that'll challenge your pride. That'll challenge the very foundation of your life. He said that is the one thing that keeps you from true peace and eternal life. If all we had to do was give in order to have a, a, a genuine relationship with God, people would give so much money to churches we wouldn't know what to do with it. People would give so much money to Shorter University we wouldn't, we wouldn't know what to do with it. But what holds us back is the refusal to give up, to let go to surrender. Do you want the peace and the meaning and the internal life that Jesus offers? Do you want it bad enough to empty your hands, your heart, and yourself? See, as long as this was a religious conversation, this rich young ruler was interested. He wanted to hear more of what Jesus had to say. He was like, man, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, let's talk, talk about religion. 
But when it became a cost issue, he was like, eh, I've, I've got too much to lose. I, 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 can't, let, I can't let go of that. I, I think what the man was asking when he came to Jesus, I think what he was really asking when he said, what do I have to do to inherit an eternal life? He was, I think he was really asking, is there a form I need to fill out? You know, is there a form I need to fill out so the preacher will come see me? You know, we can have this nice little conversation. Is there a form I need? Or is there a synagogue I need to go to? Or is there a preacher I need to listen to? Is there a podcast I need to listen to? Is there an experience I need to have? Is there another rule I need to obey? You see, I think this man would have loved that conversation. We would love that conversation. But Jesus' response was, no, there's no form to fill out. There's no class to go to. There's no book to read. There's no preacher to listen to. You have a choice to make. You have a decision to make. You've got a decision to make. You've got a choice to make. You've got to want Christ bad enough to make some adjustments in the way you relate to the things of this world. When you really want what God offers, when you've really decided to go after eternal things, it will make you adjust your relationship to the things of this world and to yourself. It will. You can't have them both. You can't say, Jesus is my Savior and Lord, and yet I'm the center of my life. Those two things don't mix. You can't do that. Something's got to give. Something has got to give. Look at how this ends. Jesus says in verse 24 and 25, he says, Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And Jesus' disciples were sitting there, and they were listening to this, and they heard all of that. And the, disciple, the disciples would have looked at this man and said, Wow, look at all he's got going on in his life, man. He's rich. He's wealthy. He's a leader. He's, he's, he's moral. He's successful. He's, he's a pillar of the community. Surely he's in when it comes to the kingdom of God. Surely he's going to make it. And Jesus says, no, see, he's got a problem. It'd be easier for God to pull a camel through the eye of a needle, which God could do if he wanted to, than for this rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so the disciples are sitting there going, going and read the rest of the passage. The disciples are sitting there going, well, man, if he can't make it, what chance do we have? They're all sitting there thinking, we got two chances, slim and none. We, you know, we're, we're done. And Peter, being Peter in verse 28, he says to Jesus, he says, behold, he says, Jesus, look, look at us. We, we've left our own homes. We've given up everything and followed you. And you know what Jesus essentially says? He says, Peter, that's it. You're closer than you realize. You're closer than this rich young ruler will ever be. Why? Because you started down the path of letting go of everything and following me. And that would find its ultimate fulfillment in seeing Jesus crucified, but then in seeing Jesus resurrected and, and the light bulb coming on and them going, He is the Messiah. And that's why you can see Peter who was afraid of a teenage girl at the trial of Jesus, you go over to the book of Acts, and there he is standing in front of the governor. Just tell him, hey, look, you're the one who killed Jesus. I don't mind telling you. You and all these other people. And if you don't acknowledge his name, you don't have salvation. It's that plain and simple. You see, Jesus, Peter had come to the point where he realized, yeah, he paid a cost. He had to let it all go. But he got so much more than he ever thought he could have. What's your one thing? What is it that God keeps putting his finger on and he says, you know, it's that right there. That is what's keeping you from knowing me. That is what's keeping you from peace. That is what is keeping you from finding ultimate meaning in your life. What is your one thing? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the challenge of these verses of this story, Lord. And I pray, God, that as you have brought that one thing to, to mind and to heart for all of us, myself included, Lord, that, 
That, Lord, we would not give it ultimate importance. We would know that it's a passing thing, that it's a, it's a, it's a temporal thing. It is not the stuff of eternity. Whether that be a relationship, whether that be material things, Lord, it ultimately is our pride and ourselves. And Father, help us to get over ourselves so that we can be totally caught up in who you are and in your love for us and in your desire for us and your design for us to know you, to walk with you, to live with you in your presence day after day. Father, may this challenge ring in our hearts and minds. And we pray, God, that through the Holy Spirit, we would have the courage to change where we need to change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Have a good day.